Hola, buenas tardes, bienvenidos a Lighthouse de nuevo. Estamos hoy con el doctor Matías Rath. Es para mí un honor presentar a este doctor alemán. Uh, es, era director del Instituto uh, Paul Linus Pauling y ha hecho dos libros importantes. El primero es Victoria sobre el cáncer, que habla de medicina celular. Y el segundo, y para mí fundamental y súper interesante, es el de las raíces nazis de la Unión de Bruselas, donde ahonda sobre temas económicos y políticos, sobre todo de las farmacéuticas. Bienvenido, Matías. How are you? Bien. Ok. I've been uh, listening to you and you are exceptional. I'm very honored to have you here in this interview. Um, I know that you've been director of uh, Linus Pauling Institute. This was uh, a long time ago, long time probably. Ago. Mm -hmm. What is the importance of vitamins for human beings? Vitamins mean life. Okay. Every cell is uh, only working if the energy is being created within what is called the um, biological power plants of the cells or mitochondria. And the fuel, the main fuel these cells use to function properly are vitamins and other micronutrients. So the sentence vitamins mean life uh, is a, a good summary of what the significance is. Okay. How do you connect this medicine and cells and vitamins with power, with pollution, with pharma cartel? I didn't do that in the beginning. I was a scientist who was interested in solving problems of uh, human health, starting with uh, cardiovascular disease. And, and I started off very conventionally at the uh, medical school in Hamburg and doing research in what uh, causes arteriosclerosis. And then stumbled on the role of vitamin C in uh, that context. Uh, at which point I thought that uh, everyone should be interested in this discovery. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, over a long process of um, learning um, for me that I realized the interest groups in the field of health and that vitamins or any substances that are not patentable are not only unwanted, they are being actively fought. And research into this field of natural, non-patentable health uh, is being neglected, uh, obstructed by the status quo um, for economic reasons primarily. Mm -hmm. And they are, um, in a nutshell, um, the following, um, the pharmaceutical industry is dominating the healthcare field at this point in time and it is an investment industry uh, which means that the value this industry creates comes from um, molecules that they create, they invent, they mm -hmm. synthesize and uh, they patent and um, therefore they by the very nature of their business must protect this business principle of patented pharmaceutical drugs and from that analysis follows that in order to protect their markets with these patented drugs, they need to fight everything that undermines this market by, for example, showing that vitamins can prevent atherosclerosis and that the hardening of the arteries is a precursor of vitamin deficiency disease curvy. Mm -hmm. I'm undermining a multi-billion dollar business with calcium antagonists, beta blockers, diuretic preparations, ACE inhibitors, etc. That was something I didn't know uh, at the time when I went into that field of scientific investigation. 
but uh, I think it's part of um, of life. It's part of human beings that uh, we need to adapt. And um, together with my colleagues, we know that many diseases, human diseases, that kill millions of people today in Spain and other countries are actually caused, directly caused, or favored by long-term vitamin deficiencies. And once you know that as a scientist, and once there is someone who, or there are interest groups that obstruct you from uh, telling that, or researching that, or uh, even want uh, to put you f uh, to prison so that you mm -hmm. cannot no longer say that, then uh, you need to take a decision. And that decision is, are you going to fight these interests, or are you just uh, giving in? There is no middle way. There, mu there must be a big interest. It's big money around. It is, yeah. Can you define what companies or what groups control this? Well, I think the largest export nation of pharmaceutical drugs currently is the US, followed by Great Britain, and then I believe still Germany and Japan, France, are some of the following uh, nations. And uh, that uh, global market share defines uh, generally the uh, support by the respective governments. Historically speaking, Germany has been the lead export nation of pharmaceutical drugs during the previous century, but that has shifted slightly. Um, the, the companies, companies the well, the companies are the same, and, and yes, uh, uh, but it doesn't um, bring us further in our battle if we start attacking individual companies. It is the principle uh, we need to understand, the principle mm -hmm. of the pharmaceutical business with disease. Uh, a few years ago, I formulated what I called the laws of the pharmaceutical industry. And the first mm -hmm. law was to say a pharmaceutical industry is not a health business, is a business, it is an investment business, which is an important realization because mm -hmm. uh, people think, oh, pharmaceutical industry, this is, uh, uh, these are the guys that provide health. No, no, no. Uh, they pretend they look to provide, more. they pretend to provide health. Mm -hmm and uh, their, their true nature of existence is to make money from uh, uh, the patented products. Uh, secondly, second law was that uh, uh, the uh, prevention and elimination of disease is not uh, the primary target of this or primary interest of this mm -hmm. industry, but in fact the maintenance of these diseases and their promotion even the invention of new diseases um, because that is the business they are in. Diseases are their markets, so they need to keep them alive and expand them. Uh, third um, is they of course cannot say that openly because uh, people and governments would revolt, so there is uh, about uh, uh, 50 to 60 percent of the money they spend is in what they call marketing, mm -hmm. which is of, call, uh, of course the deception um, to cover what you, they really do. It's a lot of power, a lot of money. A lot of power. And in the lead export nations of pharmaceutical products, there has been a, a long standing, um, long standing connection between these corporate interests and government uh, officials and regulatory agencies and etc etc take for example germany they uh, the the entire german nation uh, after world war 2 mm -hmm. was called west germany uh, was created around the chemical pharmaceutical uh, cartel bayer bsf hooks uh, the uh, uh, several chancellors came directly from uh, these uh, companies mm -hmm. and were promoted into the highest office, meaning the Chancellor of Germany. Like Helmut Kohl was a lead uh, person and of course the people around him, Mr. Schäuble, uh, Angela Merkel, are direct offsprings of Helmut Kohl's mm -hmm. uh, era. Um, and. Um, and all areas of German society are uh, have been um, affected by the very nature of 
the power of these interest groups mm -hmm. um, and, um, and whether that is medicine, uh, a strong connection into the medical schools, what you learn as a medical student, strong connection into the media, um, a strong connection even in the legal system uh, so that uh, uh, when you are being attacked as someone who is challenging the pharmaceutical interests you uh, face an uphill battle because the pharmaceutical interest is just uh, uh, the common denominator of that society. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, tell me what do you say in your book? What uh, is it about? Which book? The one uh, with the United Europe. The Nazi roots of the Brussels yes. EU. Um, what is the connection between these big groups, pharmaceutical, with the politicians and the Nazis in, yeah. in, in the wars? Well, uh, first, mm, the people of the world were told uh, about history that there was World War I and uh, it just happened. Um, some uh, states, uh, some kings or emperors at that time uh, ended, up, ended up in some rivalry and mm -hmm. suddenly there was war. Not so. This war was a war of conquest, organized, uh, conceived, strategically planned by uh, pharmaceutical and chemical cartel, namely Bayer, BASF, Hoechst, um, who at that time had the lead in identifying new molecules, reproducing them, patenting them, owning them, and they wanted to export this model to other countries. Now these other countries, they didn't want to be controlled by them, so they needed to organize a military mm -hmm. uh, adventure military conquest of these countries and now we understand that um, the, the um, World War One was nothing less than the first attempt of these of this new industry the chemical pharmaceutical uh, concentration of power um, to claim uh, the domination of Europe and the world and then uh, this uh, adventure ended in a defeat, luckily, uh, at the price of millions of people dying. And the German emperor was sent into the uh, exile and uh, the corporate interest continued and invested in the Nazis. And Bayer, BASF, Hoechst, by that time they had formed the IG Farben cartel, um, but became the largest supporter of the Nazis rise to power and uh, at the end of World War II after uh, the defeat after 1945 there was even a specific trial mm -hmm. uh, where 24 managers of IG Farben were tried for the crimes they committed in Nuremberg but um, that is just the backdrop of this book what really triggered me to initiate this project was that we were able to find documents about the key architect of the Brussels EU. Mm -hmm. Unbeknown to most people, uh, this was a gentleman by the name of Walter Holstein. Walter Holstein was um, a prominent lawyer in Nazi Germany. He was member of a delegation that was sent down by the Hitler regime to Rome uh, to negotiate with the Mussolini lawyers um, about the future shape of Europe mm -hmm. after they had conquered Europe. That was in June 1938, uh, one and a half years, or, uh, 14 months before they started World War II, they knew they would do this, they knew they would launch this war, and they started to think how are they going to administer this conquered countries, what are the laws, the administrative regulations. Mm -hmm. And Hartstein was the key uh, person in that, in the German delegation for the new architecture of a Nazi cartel Europe. 
Luckily, that didn't happen, and everyone thought that uh, key people of that nature would uh, actually go to prison or would be sentenced uh, uh, and removed from public office or, f you know, put away. Not so with Mr. Hartstein. When he was uh, interrogated by the what was called the Denazification Committee of the Allies, mm -hmm. there were specific committees set up to uh, make sure that um, the Nazis uh, could not continue with their uh, with their um, philosophy and and. Um, when he was interviewed, he lied to them. He was a, the, they had to sign a, a document um, indicating whether they were members of Nazi organizations and mm -hmm. uh, were promoting that philosophy and stuff like that. And uh, we got hold of that, uh, that document. Yes. And uh, we saw that he was, uh, he was just outright lying. He was a member of uh, the most notorious uh, professional organization of the Nazis, which is was the Nazi um, association of what they called protectors of the law. Mm -hmm. I mean the Nazi law, you yes. know. Uh, and, um, and he was a lead figure for the Nazi state in these negotiations. And he just lied. He just said, oh, well, I'm innocent. And uh, that was his entree into the next life. And he was picked up, picked up by uh, the first German Chancellor Adenauer, and um, they uh, and promoted to uh, the position of the first, um, well, first promoted to the chief negotiator for preparing the Rome Treaties, which mm -hmm. became uh, in 1957 the first legal foundation of the Brussels EU. And then he was promoted by uh, the West German government to become the um, first president of the EU Commission and he was given uh, 8,000 uh, and something bureaucrats, people working, people working under him, mm -hmm. uh, only responsible to this one person to create what we today know as, uh, as uh, the Brussels EU Europe, including the undemocratic structures uh, that uh, uh, the uh, Brussels, uh, the, the EU Commission was created as an exclusive exec executive committee uh, responsible to literally no one. That's how it's phrased. Mm -hmm. um, not the people, not the governments, to no one. They have the exclusive right to initiate legislation. Where are we? We are living in the 21st century and everyone thinks we are living in a democracy. Uh, it's uh, an outright dictatorship there on behalf of corporate interests. And it's fantastically masked by the propaganda that is being made to praise Europe as uh, the model of peace and the model of prosperity and etc. etc. And it's only now that the crisis that uh, this model initiated, the, uh, the, the one-sidedness for the corporate interests, in Spain and other countries uh, in Europe, Greece, Italy, Portugal, Ireland, and so on. So pretty soon, France and ultimately also Germany. Uh, um, it is only now that this crisis is breaking open that uh, these um, facts uh, can be traced back to their origin. Mm -hmm. So, in a nutshell, uh, the Hallstein documents were the for me the main reason. Uh, to uh, launch this project. I was very happy to have good colleagues working with me. Uh, uh, Dr. Nitsuki, my long-standing colleague from Poland, Paul Taylor, and uh, of course August Kowalczyk, who is a survivor of the Auschwitz concentration camp. Mm -hmm. And um, with his support for this book, he of course um, was adding a lot of authenticity as one of the victims of, uh, of Auschwitz. Auschwitz being, of course, 100% um, subsidiary of IG Farben at the time. And what was it used for Auschwitz? What okay. were they doing in Auschwitz? Ah. Um, well, that's another uh, something else that um, 
few people know. We've been told that uh, there was the Auschwitz concentration camp, but it was run by uh, crazy SS people, and they uh, it was a, basically a racial, uh, mo racially motivated concentration and extermination camp, which in fact it was uh, in part. But the reason why it became that factory of death was the decision of I.G. Farben in 1941 to build what was to become the largest corporate uh, structure outside mm -hmm. uh, Germany, wartime Germany, uh, 40, uh, sorry, 24 square kilometer size industrial plant to produce uh, synthetic rubber and other war essential uh, synthetic products which they needed for the conquest of Russia and uh, Eastern Europe and Asia ultimately. Mm -hmm. And IG Auschwitz, this huge, uh, this huge uh, plant uh, in the city of Auschwitz, uh, required a lot of slave labor. And so the um, nearby concentration camp of Auschwitz was turned into a, a giant uh, uh, slave labor camp. Mm -hmm. And um, slave labor, of course, meant at the time that if you were working at the IG Farben construction site of building this monster um, of, of synthetic production plant, you were only needed by Bayer, BASF, and Höchst as long as you could work. Mm -hmm. uh, once you were sick or they had worn you out. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was no health insurance or retirement plan. Yeah. They were killed, uh, and mm -hmm. th and thousands of them uh, were uh, just killed. It was it was called uh, extermination extermination through labor. Mm -hmm. And if you remember that sentence, yes. "Labor liberates." It was the Nazi speak, or Nazi uh, news speak, I should say. And if you remember the uh, inscript on the uh, concentration camp of Auschwitz, um, Labor liberates, yes. Arbeit macht frei. It was Nazi newspeak for exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. It was killing extermination through slave labor. Yes. And uh, also the experiments, the medical experiments then, uh, were uh, not conducted uh, on behalf of the SS. The SS was a, a troop of murderers. They had didn't have the intelligence to create drugs or uh, anything commercially uh, accessible and of, of any value. They were uh, they were uh, the uh, guys who executed uh, mm -hmm. the commercial interests of Bayer and Höchst, mainly those two companies, who tested their drugs, uh, patented drugs, new mm -hmm. drugs, uh, in Auschwitz uh, and Buchenwald. Uh, and some other smaller concentration camps uh, in order to, to make them ready for the world market. And uh, now when we, all that has been part of the Nuremberg war crime tribunals, um, we at the time when we started this work there was nothing, absolutely nothing about the tribunal from Nuremberg on the web. Uh, the, the tribunal from Nuremberg against IG Farben, against mm -hmm. Bayer and BSF and Höchst, uh, on the web. In fact, uh, there were no books. There were, it wasn't in printed form available either. And I got curious. I said, well, how much money do you need to spend from these companies mm -hmm. to cover your past? Mm -hmm. uh, not just in the newspapers, but also in books, in the history books, in everything our children are being taught in, in, in school about the origin yes. of, uh, of World War II. And so we, uh, our foundation, um, went ahead and uh, we found um, uh, quite some documents in national archives uh, about this trial. Mm -hmm. And uh, we published by now about 50,000 of these records on profit over life online. Uh, and it's it's uh, there's no way that the current understanding of World War II uh, by the general public mm -hmm. that it was a racially motivated mm -hmm. war 
uh, can be upheld. There's no way. Uh, it was a, um, it was a, uh, the second attempt of the chemical pharmaceutical cartel from Germany uh, at World Congress based on 40,000 patents or what they had at the time, uh, trying to impose that uh, economic uh, uh, money printing machine on the world. Do you think it might be a third attempt to do it? Yeah, obviously uh, what we see uh, today is nah, going back to 1945. Again, what we saw is that the political and the military uh, puppets okay. were, were sentenced in Nuremberg to death or to lifetime in prison and, and rightly so. But the puppeteers, uh, mm -hmm. the guys who actually planned this war and made it possible and hired the Nazis to implement it, they were sentenced uh, with a few years, uh, like for example these, uh, the CEO, the chief executive of Bayer, Termier, was sentenced to seven years in prison in 1948. In 1956, eight years later, he was not only out of prison, he was back as the chairman of the board of Bayer again. Now, what do we learn from that? Mm -hmm. We learn from it that the interest groups had a certain continuity. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was in 1956, in 19, exactly the year when the final documents on the Brussels EU were signed. Uh, when the German government, with Bayer being its, its corporate flagship, became the driving force of this Brussels EU. Mm -hmm. And you can see that uh, by the mid-50s, mean 10 years after their second attempt failed, they were back in business. Uh, and they were right at it to uh, create the third attempt, this time without military, um, without military component but um, by means of uh, um, uh, a heinous strategy of, of economic strangulation and of, of political coercion. At that time, 60, 70 years ago now, they knew that the day would come that Spain is in this crisis that mm -hmm. they, uh, it is today, that Italy will soon be there, there that uh, Greece is in this. Sure. They knew that at that time. And that was their target. That was their goal, the determined, predetermined goal. It's all and, planned. Excuse me? It's all planned. It was all planned. The, 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 and you will see that in a few days um, there will be some uh, politicians meeting in Brussels or Strasbourg and saying, oh, we should take advantage of this crisis mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and unite yes. and make a political union out of Europe or the United States of Europe. And <laughs> so. Uh, shall we say, uh, uh, seven decades after their second attempt failed, they've, they reached their ultimate goal, mm -hmm. almost. Um, meaning that they create a, a body uh, in Europe uh, that rules every part of life, not democratically. Yeah. You cannot elect them, you cannot throw them out of office. They are there mm -hmm. to control you and your life. With, you, we with, uh, with the Brussels EU, yeah. So the Brussels EU, uh, the, construct of the Brussels EU is uh, the third attempt and uh, they never came that close. I mean uh, some people say oh, you know, why the Nazis were ruthless destroyers, of, they were just there to, to uh, destroy everything. Mm -hmm. It's a crazy thought. They were ruthless, they were criminals and there's nothing uh, better to say about them. They deserved uh, every punishment in the world but they were hired Mm -hmm. because of their ruthlessness yeah. by these corporate interests. Mm -hmm. And the, the interests of the, these corporate interests, they were not interested in destruction. They were interested in making one thing, money, and controlling that, and controlling the markets, and m turning Europe into a platform to conquer the world. Mm -hmm. And this is where they are now. If you see the Brussels EU envoys uh, flying to Africa and saying, hey, African Union, you need to model your continental government according to the Brussels EU. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you have a commission of the African Union. And they go to South America, to the Mercosur, Mercosur uh, and they go to Southeast Asia, to the ASEAN, ASEAN states, and they sell their, their model mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, as the future of 
I don't know what, of, a, world, of an Aurelian world or what? A one Probably. world order. One world order, yeah. And they know they cannot accomplish that in one sweep, so they, their plan is to do it uh, with those uh, regional continental uh, takeovers, mm -hmm. uh, exporting the undemocratic Brussels model yes. to other continents uh, and then ultimately uh, uniting it uh, under one umbrella, obviously, yes. Mm -hmm. So how do you see the future? Are you optimistic with your foundation? In, uh, I think you came to Spain, you have a foundation here? Yes. Well, we came to Spain not what because... What can we do to fight this uh, uh, fascist model, let's say? The key element is education. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned this book. I think um, it's already, it has already become part of of rewriting history, uh, just understanding who was behind World War One and Two, mm -hmm. understanding who were the architects of the Brussels EU. That's the basis for change. You cannot motivate people if they do not understand. Mm -hmm. You cannot motivate people if they do not understand the origin of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going. So, am I optimistic? Yes, otherwise I wouldn't be talking to you. Okay. And uh, do we have time to do this? Well, I put it like that. I gave a talk in Berlin uh, three months ago, yes. <clears throat> and um, we put it online on YouTube, not knowing uh, what would come, and suddenly we had. Uh, uh, how many now? I think 300,000 people mm -hmm. saw that video from yes. Spain alone. Yes. So I doubt that the interest in this message would have been that great if mm -hmm. uh, the crisis would not be here. Yeah. So there is always something in a critical situation that brings mankind forward, provided. Mm -hmm. It has the right strategies, mm -hmm. and provided it unites behind these strategies and fights for it. And when we saw the great interest in this national message from Berlin, uh, from Spain, we decided that it's time to uh, come here and see what we can bring to this country. Mm -hmm. The direction is very clear. I think we are, uh, we, there are a series of things that need to be done immediately. Uh, we need to uh, inform people so that they, with the knowledge they have about the background of the Brussels EU, about the undemocratic structure, recognizes that what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, dictatorial construct artificially put there by corporate interests. Uh, they have the possibility to say no to motivate their governments to go away. The fact that the Spanish government uh, did not simply go under this umbrella of uh, the Brussels EU is already a fact, or uh, is already reflecting, I should say, the fact that uh, the government of Spain knows the instant conditions uh, that come with that step, meaning you're giving up your sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Um, so, education, empowering people to say no and turn their back on this construct. Secondly, um, the euro um, is nothing else than, uh, than the tool of tying the nations, the economies mm -hmm. of Europe to this construct in Brussels. Um, the, um, the fact that that Brussels, as I said before, is not a sign or an, a consequence of a strong um, a strong position of the cartel interests uh, is important to analyze too. We need to understand that the economic interests behind the Brussels EU are not in a very strong position. They have a lot of money, influence, etc., but mm -hmm. the technologies they are trying to sell 
um, are outdated. Uh, in what do you mean? What kind of technology? Uh, take, for example, uh, the in the field of energy, the key, okay. the key uh, um, interests behind Brussels are the um, petrochemical industry, the oil cartel, um, and more recently the uh, the nuclear energy cartel, um, and. Um, and uh, these are outdated technologies. I mean, people in Spain and everywhere, they demand uh, electrical cars. And uh, in Germany, even up in Germany, they, uh, you won't find a village where you don't have solar uh, cells on the panels on the roofs. And mm -hmm. we are here in Spain. I mean, this country should be uh, selling uh, uh, electrical current to other countries mm -hmm. because of the abundance of yes of sunshine in, in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, and here they are in Brussels uh, trying by all means to defend these outdated technologies against the will of the people. Mm -hmm. So it's obvious that um, they need this dictatorial uh, concert, not because they are bad people, but no one will buy their merchandise if they don't protect it. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for the health sector. I mean, the, uh, my own life has been, I was privileged to contribute to some discoveries in, in the area of heart disease and cancer and everywhere the breakthrough didn't come from patented pharmaceutical drugs it came from natural ingredients from plants and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, other biologically active substances and there too they're afraid of this development and they're trying to ban it and they're trying to protect this investment business around the pharmaceutical drugs so that's a weakness and we need to understand this weakness for two reasons. First of all, from a practical point of view, it mm -hmm. gives us a fantastic democratic opportunity, not just to say we don't want that and we demonstrate, but to start doing something right away in, in Spain to promote uh, solar energy as, mm -hmm. as the number one source of energy for your home, for your corporation, for the country. Uh, Spain is an agricultural country. What's wrong with uh, with starting a completely new industry, saying uh, we are uh, growing fields of uh, plants mm -hmm. of which we know uh, these are powerful anti-cancer uh, agents, uh, and to isolate these substances mm -hmm. not in micrograms but in grams. Uh, prepare or in, in kilograms and tons and exp export them, mm -hmm. uh, create uh, injectable solutions so that the concentration uh, in late stage cancer can be still increased and so on and so forth. So uh, what I'm seeing is that in fact the country's hardest hit from the crisis yes. have the greatest potential mm -hmm. for creating something new. Okay. And I think uh, since uh, I assume that some people in Spain may uh, watch this um, interview. It is your responsibility to uh, think about those aspects and take decisions if you agree with it and put the pressure on your government and say, hey, uh, why are we always talking about uh, new conditions from outside, about dependency, about giving up our sovereignty? Here we have great potentials in key area of our life which lay bare and which we can use instantly. And so there's a, this very practical aspect, but equally significant is the moral and, should I say, historical aspect of that. Mm -hmm. Without, by simply saying no to Brussels, nothing will change. We may or may not get rid of these mobsters, yes. but by taking away their economic base, mm -hmm. uh, meaning their business in energy, their business in, in the healthcare sector, their fraudulent business, I should yes. say. Uh, that is a contribution to advancing mankind mm -hmm. uh, beyond Spain, beyond Europe. And this is why I'm optimistic, why I, I'm, I'm optimistic that um, there's a chance even that the country's hardest hit can become leaders uh, in that direction, including Spain. Okay. We'll put the name of your website, and if people want to contact your foundation here in Spain, they can start working on okay. your thoughts. Okay. All right. It was a pleasure to have you here, Matias. Hope to see you soon in Barcelona. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time.